John Bramblett is a blind visual artist. He lost his vision as a result due to complications with epilepsy and Lyme's disease. Instead of becoming a creative writing teacher, he found joy and fulfillment in being an artist. He has written the book, Shouting in the Dark, and has appeared on a variety of news outlets, including NBC and BBC News. We are so happy and honored to have him with us today. What exactly caused you to lose your vision? Um, I was born with ep epilepsy, and as I got older, it developed into severe epilepsy. The seizures just got worse and worse, and I also had some neurological problems. I had, had kid kidney disease. I had a kidney removed by the time I was seven, that, and I had some other neurological sort of problems, and then probably when I was about 11, 12, 13 or so, I ended up getting Lyme's disease, um, and the Lyme's disease went undiagnosed for years because... My neurologist, you know, we, we knew about the epilepsy, so we weren't really looking for anything else. <laughs> you know, we weren't looking for another thing. Um, but the Lyme disease kept progressing, and it was causing a lot of problems. And I ended up having some seizures where um, I wasn't coming out of it, where most of the time, you know, when you have a seizure, you know, you, you eventually come out. But I was going into status epilepticus where um, my um, it, it would just ramp up, and, and my eventually my, my breathing would stop, my heart would stop. And they would have to get that regoing, and that caused some damage to my brain, um, mostly in the occipital lobe towards the back. Um, and so I had, I, had, I had a few massive seizures that um, really damaged that part of my brain. And a little bit in the hearing, but just a tiny bit in the hearing. But the vision centers were just wiped out, really. And um, so with my vision now, it's almost like a TV with the cable disconnected. If, if you think of it like that, like my eyes work, and it sends a signal back, but then um, there's nothing back there to get the signal. Well, I mean, you know, the, my, my vision center still works in my brain. Like I can still imagine things, vi visualize, but it just doesn't come from the eyes anymore. If that makes right. any sense. <laughs> no, 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 that makes sense. So basically you use your other senses, which makes um, 100% sense um, in order to um, function. Um, so you are, you've lost almost or all your vision is that correct yeah you know okay. whenever I first lost my eyesight I didn't know anything about blindness I had a lot to learn <laughs> but one of the things I didn't know like I always imagine blindness being completely black but about 95 percent of people who are blind have some sort of light perception okay. and that's what I have so I, I, my brain can tell there's light out there it just can't do anything with it so like I don't so and light usually hurts my eyes so I usually wear sunglasses because my brain will tell my eyes, dilate, dilate, let, let, let in more light, you know, and it gives me headaches. Um, so I know there's light out there, but it doesn't make shadow or form or color or anything. But, um, but it is helpful in its own way. I mean, it doesn't seem like that, that would be that helpful. But, um, you know, I can tell, like, you know, if it's nighttime or daytime, you know, mm -hmm. um, if it's a completely black room and somebody turns on a light, I can tell that, you know, a light came on. But I can't, you know, tell, like, where somebody is in it or anything. But um, mm -hmm. I don't know. But, okay. I'll, I'll take what I can get. <laughs> of course, absolutely. Um, so um, with your Lyme's disease and your epilepsy, um, what types of treatments did you, um, did you partake, partake in and were they oh, I, successful um, despite obviously your vision loss? Well, successful-ish. You know, it's funny, Growing up, like, and, and, and I had a lot of friends in hospitals. Like, I was in the hospital a lot, you know, for different things. And, and um, um, you get so used to being sick or, or being in the hospitals that you don't even want to think about it too much. So, you know, so I would, you know, I'd go to treatments. And, I, you know, in, in my mind, I, I would just try to put it out of my mind. I wouldn't even think about it. So it's funny for, like, a lot of the stuff when I was a kid, I almost have to ask my mom and dad because, you know, for me, I was just, I was just busy being a kid, you know, and then you would go, you might be in the hospital for a bit and you're like, okay, what is it this time <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. but, but, um, but I was on different cocktails of drugs ever since I was little for the epilepsy because they're always, um, they're always trying to find something that worked because where the, where I have epilepsy is in the frontal lobe and, mm -hmm. and if they could get the seizures under control, it would snow me completely under, you know, it's mm -hmm. also the part of the brain that kind of makes you who you are. So, you know, so if, if I was having tonic clonic or, or, the, or what they used to call grand mal seizures, mm -hmm. I would, um, um, if they stopped those completely, I was just like a zombie all the time, you know, and then, so it was always a fight to try to get the medication right. Um, 
epilepsy for a lot of people has, has a tendency to change over time. So sometimes you'll have different types of seizures. Sometimes it'll go away. Sometimes it'll go away for a while. It'll come back. It's just one of those things where it's hard to pin down. But I've been fortunate that um, really after college, it was, it was starting to diminish a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that was due to the artwork because it helped me, I don't know, focus on myself and start mm -hmm. taking care of myself a little bit more. Right. Um, it's, what was the process like of you realizing that you were going to be unable to teach um, and that you were going to have to pursue some other type of endeavor? Well, you know, you know what? I, I was fortunate in that um, I, I, I could have taught if I wanted to, but it went, but everything went in a different pathway because I was in college and I was so fortunate. Whenever I lost my sight, I was in college and everything was sort of put in place where if you lose, if you're not in college and you lose your eyesight, a lot of times you have, you have to go to the school for the blind and all this. But if you're actually enrolled, um, everything was put in place where they want to keep you there if you can. And I felt like I had lost so much in my life that I didn't want to leave school. I was afraid if I left school, I'd never go back. And um, so, I, but I couldn't read or write anymore for a while. I had to relearn how to read and write, but I was still good at classes. And I was a, I was a creative writing and I was English major, which is, you know, I have a dark sense of humor. But I would go to English classes and I couldn't read or, you know, read the stories and I couldn't write the papers, but I would go there anyway and I would get incompletes. But I was, I was learning how to use Braille and I was learning how to use the screen readers, for, you know, the computers and all that, the modern technology we have. So eventually I was able to make those, those, um, uh, those classes up. But um, artwork had been, always been my way of dealing with bad things in my life. Growing up, I drew all the time. I drew every day. It was just my way of dealing with stuff, you know well, if you're if you're drawing, if you're painting, you know you can't think of anything bad in your life. You're you're right there in the moment. So, one one benefit of losing my eyesight in college at that point is that I didn't have homework. So you know I would go to class, but I didn't have to worry about homework because I couldn't you know, I couldn't do it. So I would just get incomplete. But um, and I started learning how to well after learning how to use a white cane, you know how to travel independently. That that led to me thinking, well, shoot, if I can get across the city using my sense of touch. Surely I could get across a canvas if I could touch and feel, you know, like different bumps and lines and all these different things. Surely I could do that. So I just started working on that. But it, um, but it's funny though because my my work with that it it actually ended up being what I what I ended up doing. But um, you know, as a career. But I always I still always wanted to teach and even now like I I, I do a ton of teaching. I I teach classes you know all the. T uh, before, before, you know, all, all this current unpleasantness, you know, with the virus and everything going on, I would, you know, I would, I would usually fly three or four times a month, you know, I'd work with different groups. I am, um, I do virtual workshops and all that. And all my workshops are free. It never costs anything for anybody to paint with me. And, um, but as I travel and do shows and things, I, I, I get to teach, I get to, um, you know, so that's been fun. I don't know. I'm sorry for the long winded answer. No, I, I get excited it's, about art. I get excited about disability awareness. And when you combine the two together, I just talk, talk, talk. <laughs> no, it's good. I actually do something creative. And what mm -hmm. I do for um, something being creative is either why well, bake because I find that very therapeutic, but then also oh, B awesome. is that I'll do some type of art. So I typically will do um, collaging because I really like to collage. Oh, um, oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I've done, I've made, um, I've sewn and, you know, crocheted and all of that. Um, but that's you know, brilliant. The that's also awesome. very relaxing, as you, you know, have mentioned. Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I, I would have lost my mind. That's why, that's why I started, whenever I started painting, there weren't really blind painters. Like, there was one guy in Turkey that I learned about, but I didn't know about anybody at the time. So I was just trying to figure it out myself. And, the only reason that I was doing it was because I was going, I was so depressed and I was so angry that I was just losing my mind and I had to do something. And the brilliant thing about art, I, I think to me, and it doesn't matter if it's painting, like baking is awesome. I love to cook. I don't know you, anything that's creative, anything, but the wonderful thing about art though, is that it's all about what you can do. It doesn't matter what you can't do. You know, it's just, you know, it's about finding a way to accomplish something and, and it's just, you know, and it, it puts you in such a, a great frame of mind. You know, when you're depressed and you're down, it doesn't seem like anything new can ever happen. It, doesn't, it seems like everything's just going to be negative and bad forever. And it, you just can't see a light at, at all. But with artwork, even if it's just like one little brush stroke at a time, 
you're making something new all the time, you know, and of course, you know, and, and you're right there in the moment. You're not thinking about anything in the past you've lost. You're not worried about stresses in the future. You're right there, you know, in that very positive sort of moment. No, it's great. And it really, you know, research shows that it really um, has a positive effect um, on um, the brain and mood clearly as we're it did, discussing. It did um, mine because my brain's crazy basically. <laughs> and it, it's, it's, what, it's, it's what keeps me sane, I think. <laughs> I, I, I literally, I paint every day. I, I um, and, and generally when I'm at home in the studio, I'll, I'll paint 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, seven days oh. a week. And, oh, uh, wow. and I, I've done this for, you know, since uh, if I'm traveling, it's less right. because, you know, it has to be, but, but, um, but, I am. Um, yeah. But, but I, I've set it up though. So my family can be around. So while I'm painting, I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll take breaks and I'll do stuff with my son. I promise. I, right. no, but, no. Um, but you know, but it, I, I just, yeah, I paint a lot, but it, it's what wonderful. keeps my brain working. I think it's my way of seeing the world. Yeah, for sure. So can you tell us a little bit about um, the process of your painting um, and how you do paint? Um, yes. Yeah, that's a good question, probably, because that's that's usually what I'm asked. Um, um, so here, here, let me show you. Well, yeah, I'm for painting sure. right here. I forgot. I'm just working on it. Um, so the way that I paint, what it stems from is is is, is a basic orientation and mo mobility training that that you learn whenever you start learning how to use a white cane. So if you're visually impaired, you start learning how to use your sense of touch to be able to to navigate the world and to be able to orient yourself. So whether you're getting around a room and you're touching the walls, you're trailing walls, you're, you're touching furniture and you're making a mental map, um, or if you're crossing the city, you know, and you're using that white cane, which is basically just an extension of your hand. So you're reaching out and you're able to touch and there's different techniques to be able to, to, to get around, but, but you're feeling different things around. So like if you're traveling down a sidewalk, you would be feeling the curb, you know, and you're feeling the sidewalk and the curb and you're going down that straight line. And then if you hit another street, that's crossing it, you would know exactly where in the city you are. You know, it's right where those two streets cross. You can't be anywhere else in the city. So suddenly you're oriented, you know where you are. <laughs> it's easy peasy. Well, I, I started thinking, well, good grief. If I could get across the city, um, I could get across a canvas. So the way that I do that is by drawing with lines that I can touch and feel. So when I first started, all the lines had to be giant, like really, really thick. But over the years, it's been almost 20 years since I started, um, they, they can be a lot thinner. They just have to feel different. So on this painting I have here, um, there's a bunch of trees. So, um, so there's actually, I can feel the lines that are, that are making the trees. Um, and this lets me know where I am and where I've been. And if you're a sighted artist, that's really all you use your eyesight for, is to know where you are and everywhere you've been. If you're a visually impaired person, you're going to use your sense of touch for that. To use your sense of touch to do that everywhere you are. So it just makes mm -hmm. sense. But, oh, let me, let me yeah. get a cube of paint real quick. <laughs> okay. I'd love to see, yes. Oh, oh so um, the other thing you use your eyes for, of course, is, 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 is color. So I have, I have a tube of paint here, and I just braille my paint. So this is a light green. So I just braille uh, the letters. Oh, right, your braille. Yeah. So, yeah. but what's more fun, though, what, what I do... So I can braille the tubes so I know which, which tube is which. But whenever it comes to start mixing the paints on the palette, I add different mediums into the paint. And, um, and that just makes the paint feel different. So what paint is, you know, with paint, you have a medium, which is really just the sticky stuff that holds paint together. And then paint's also colors. You have pigment in the medium. And you put those together and you've got paint. So what I do is I change the mediums. So I can mix a medium into the paint that'll make it really, really thick. Like there's some that'll make it like where it's almost like putty and others where it feels like oil or, or and another that makes it feel like water. So if I took a, um, well, I've lost my paint again. What if, I, if I took a really thick medium and mixed it into the white, I can make that white feel like toothpaste. It would be really thick. Um, I can mix a different medium into the black and make the black feel oily. So it's really mm -hmm. runny and oily. So on a palette, I had this really thick paint and the really thin paint. There's no way I'm going to confuse the two. You know, I know if I'm touching the thick paint, it's got to be white. Then if I want to mix um, the colors together, if I want a gray that's halfway between that black and white, I just mix for the texture that's halfway between the two. You know, that's half as thick or twice as runny or, you know, whichever way I'm going with it. And, um, it, and it gives you a way to be able to control color. 
and I know it sounds, you know, to most people, it sounds a little hard. Um, but here's, here's the weird fact. Um, I, I work with museums all over the country. My, my, my artwork has gone to 120 countries. We travel, um, and I, I'm a cultural ambassador for the United States now, and they send me, send me around, and I'm able to teach workshops. I have blindfolded tens of thousands of people, and I'll, I'll blindfold them, and I'll give them a drawing that I've made that has a raised lines, and, and I'll give them paint that I've mixed, and in five or ten minutes, everybody's painting. And it's just wow. it's sort of a cartoonish sort of painting. You know, it's not like, you know, it's not like, you know, um, like Van Gogh or something <laughs> right, mm -hmm. right away. But but everybody can tell what which color is which. They know where they are on the drawing. It's just, I don't know, it just, it just makes me feel so good when, when I'm doing that. And and it's funny because um, before we'll start, start a workshop like that, people will say, like, I just have no idea how you could paint without being able to see. And then five or ten minutes into the workshop, it's it's almost almost every time. It's so funny. They're like, "Oh, I get it. I understand." You know, mm -hmm. it's hard, like you know, see, But so is any drawing, any paint. But it's it's just different. So right. Sorry for the rambling explanation. But. No, no, it's it totally makes sense, and it's it's absolutely amazing. So for people that um, want to get into art who are blind, did. Are there programs nowadays? Um, I know you speak about how you hold some virtual classes. But are there programs or um, classes to teach people um, who are blind how to do art um, if they don't That's you know, happen question. to think about you know the sense of feel and um, touch and so forth? You know, um, there there isn't. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot out there. But that's changing. Um, I, I work with blind, blind services with seven different states. Okay. Um, you, you know, and I, and I mentioned like being the cultural ambassador, so they're sending me out. So I've been working with Brazil, and we're helping the children there that are visually impaired. Um, but it's starting to become a thing in some schools for the blind where they're starting to, to teach these techniques, and they're starting. But here's the brilliant thing, though, and this is so – I wish I could say that I envisioned it, like, you know, that I, I knew this would happen. But um, I didn't. It was just a happy accident with it. But um, children, most any any ch child with a visual impairment that I've met, they hate the cane. They hate using a white cane because at first you're bumping into things. It's hard to use. You, it's easier just to grab somebody's elbow and have somebody guide you around. But once you learn how to use it, you're independent. You can go wherever you want. But um, so so kids hate the cane. But the way that I paint is basically those cane techniques. So we'll teach these kids how to paint. And then they accidentally sort of learn how to use the cane, you know, because the, and the more they paint, the better they are. But in a few weeks of these kids learning how to paint, their ability to get around a room just explodes. It's just crazy. They're so much more independent. They're able to, to cross a room. Like so, I've had so many teachers come over and tell me that, oh, but, you know, oh, before you started the art classes, all the kids would, would stay in their desk. Nobody would ever get up. You know, it was, it was so – everything was very structured. Then after them doing art for a few weeks, suddenly they're getting up and they're talking to their friend on the other side of the classroom and they're getting their own paper or they're doing this. And she said, it's awesome, but it's so chaotic. I'm not used to the kids running all over the place, but right. it's, um, it just makes a huge difference. But, um, but there isn't a whole lot of places to go and get that. And um, I, um, I live stream twice a week on Facebook and you, you, YouTube. And, and we have lots of people that come through that want, you know, that, um, there's some places where they have programs, but most places just don't. And um, so, right. um, so I, 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 gosh, one of the main things, we, we, our, my, our emails here in the studio are almost never below a thousand because we're always getting people asking, how do you paint? Where do you go? Where do you do mm -hmm. this? And it's so sad because most of the time we're like, well, you know, here's what I do, you know, but there's not really a, a teacher that you can go to. Or, and and um, so I try to encourage people like, well, Tune in on the live streams and stuff because we'll chat about anything. <laughs> you know, if you want to know, like you you paint along with me. You know, we'll 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 do it. We'll figure it out. You know, and um, but right. it's just I don't know. I, I I wish I wish I had a better answer right now, but um, no, um, it's it's gonna be better enough. And actually, be yeah, no, it's good enough. I mean, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of um. Uh, aside from the stuff that you do, um, a lot of programs um, out there to teach uh, people of the blind art and so forth. But for people who are watching um, and clearly interested in becoming an artist or have a ch or has a child or spouse or partner, whatever the case may be, um, interested in art, 
Um, how do they um, find you? Because um, you do do some virtual um, classes. Yeah, yeah, and um, and it's it never costs anything. It's always free, right. and um, um, so the, the the best way to find me is just my last name, but Bramblet, like on Facebook, it's Bramblet. On Twitter, it's, I don't tweet very much, but on Twitter, it's Bramblet, and on um, Instagram, it's Bramblet. YouTube is Bramblet, and and if you forget my name, if you type in Blind Painter, like on Google or somewhere, I'll, I'll pop up. And um, um, and then and my website is Bramblet. It's just Bramblet.com. Everything is Bramblet. That way it's easy for me. I don't, I don't forget it. It's easy for me to get around. Of course. And yeah, I'm just asking for, for them, for our audience to know. I mean, clearly I know how to find you. Um, but yeah, then yeah. that's how they contact you. And so Thank on. you for asking that. I, I, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, and I really encourage people because um, it, it depends on where you are. Like there, there's some places where there's a lot of, there's a lot of help. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other places there's zero help. And, and especially a lot of people who lose their eyesight are older, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and it seems like you get past a certain age and there's even less help out there, you know, like maybe, you know, you know, people say, oh, well, you're getting older. I guess that's it. You know, you're not, you're not gonna be able to do what you used to be able to do, which right. is just a complete lie. That's just, that's not even it's not even a little bit true. Mm -hmm. um, and no, and of uh, there's you, it's, it's not easy. Adapting to being visually impaired was extremely hard, but once I adapted, I don't even think about it anymore. And I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life sighted or not. I mean, losing my eyesight didn't make me happier, but it's just not a factor in my life. That's, you know, that makes me sad or anything. It's just, you know, it's just, you know, I've, I'm, I have a certain height, I have a certain weight, that weight should be lower, but I have a certain weight <laughs> and I happen to be blind, you know? So um, it's just one of those things. I don't know. It's funny, but at the time it, it can just seem like it's a life ending sort of thing. Mm -hmm. No, no, for sure. Um, so talking about your blindness specifically, um, I know you mentioned um, that, I mean, you wear sunglasses um, and you also have a seeing eye dog, um, but can you tell us how you um, navigate the world um, on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes, and um, I'm, I, I use my seeing eye dog, and, and, I, and I have to say the seeing eye dogs now that we have are different than the ones we had in the past. Mm -hmm. Like the ones now are made, like they, they work with smartphones, you have a smart dog and a smartphone, you can literally do anything. It's wow. like, like, like my, my guide dog over here, I hear her snoring. Um, she, her name is Eagle. And like we, we travel, we, well, right, right now we're not, but in normal times we travel a lot and I, I give a lot of talks. I give a lot of speeches. So a lot of times it's just a turnaround trip. So my wife doesn't go and um, I, I just go, me, me, me and Eagle will hop on a plane and we'll, we'll go. And I can do that because of the incredible dog, you know, that she is. So if I'm in an airport that I've never been in and I want to find the men's room, I can just ask her, say, Eagle, find the boys. And she knows the difference between a men's room and a ladies' bathroom. Um, she knows the difference between a stall, a urinal. She, she knows she can find the sink, a trash can. She'll remember what seat I was sitting in. So she'll take me all the way back to the gate and, and take me right back to the exact same seat. Even if there's somebody sitting in that seat now, because you know, she is, she is a dog, so she doesn't realize. So there's somebody sitting in the seat that I had been sitting in. Um, she'll still take me right there and put her nose right in the middle of that person. You know, you know, like, oh, that's John C. <laughs> but so I've made some right. quick friends in the airport. <laughs> but um, it's just incredible, though. And like, you know, so and once I'm in a hotel, she'll remember which room I'm in. She'll find the counter for me. Um, and if I want to get a cup of coffee or something, I can get on my phone and ask my phone if there's a coffee shop within what walking distance. And if there is, it'll, you know, it'll give me, you know, the app will give me directions and, and I'll feed those directions to Eagle, you know, like Eagle, go forward, Eagle, find left. And it's um incredible. And, but I, I'm always trying to push it a little bit. Like um, I, a few years ago, I became the first visually impaired person to ever do a mural. And I've been doing some enormous murals. I, I'm, I'm out working on one right now that's 27 feet by 10 feet. And I've done some four story murals. I painted a 737. And I did all this because I'm always working with children and I'm always telling the kids like, you can do whatever you want. You can do anything. And, um, and so I keep trying to push things a little bit and, um, cause I have to do it through touch. So I thought, well, what would be the hardest thing to do through touch? And I thought, well, maybe something big enough where you can't touch the whole thing <laughs> at one time. And, but using the techniques that I've learned by you for using a white cane and, and my incredible guide dog Eagle, you know, it, it's just, I don't know, it's powerful, but the really cool thing, is that it doesn't really cost anything. 
It's just knowledge. So if you can learn how to, I mean, like what I do isn't special. There isn't anything that's unique to me about it. I've taught hundreds and hundreds of visually impaired people how to paint. There, it's, it's just, if, if you know the basic idea of how to use a white cane, you can get across a canvas, you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, and I love that because it's not like, oh, you've got to buy this really expensive equipment or you need this special thing or this thing. It's just, you know, it's just a little bit of, of instruction. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, now, just getting back to um, Eagle and, your, and um, him being a seeing eye dog, for those that um, are unfamiliar with um, getting a seeing eye dog and so forth, did you go through, you went through an organization. Right, um, right, yeah. And, and did you and, pick out the dog prior and then he went to training or kind of how does that process work? Um, what organizations are there? That's, that's a really good question because the guide dogs are a little bit different than the other service dogs mm -hmm. uh, because they, they've, they've been around for so many de decades, but, but, and their training is by far the longest because, you know, they, they, they have your life in your hands, you know, so every time you step out, you know, it's, uh, so they have to be perfect <laughs> and, and they have to really want to do it. And they have to like in the guide dogs, like they aren't spanked or anything, you know, either they want to work or they don't. And if they don't, that's fine. You don't have to be a guide dog. You can go be a fan, you know, a pet dog or something, but it's just the dogs that really want to stop at every curve and really want to do it, but they're, they're bred for it. So like, like Eagle, she comes from a breeding program that's like decades old and they, and they, and so if any dog in the litter has like any um, health problems, every dog that's related to it is washed out of the program. If, if any dog was aggressive, which is unknown really with a guide dog, because any dog that's even a little aggressive, every dog that dog is related to is washed out of the program. So after decades of this, you end up with these crazy, sweet, hyper-intelligent dogs that you can just talk to. You know, it's like, what a, hey, baby, why don't you come over here? You want to lay down over here? And she's like, ah, you know, just like, just listens to your every word. It's ridiculous. But even past that, though, um, only about 50 to 70% of the dogs make it through training. And the training is two years long. Um, and the first year, it's just like being a puppy, learning puppy things, learning how to sit and all these kind of things. And then the next year, it's more intensive sort of guide dog training, which I got to say, I, I've been on the board of directors for the guide dog school and the dogs love it. Like the dogs just eat it up because of them. It's just like 24 seven plays time, you know, because they love to do things and they love to show you how smart they are. And so it's just, I don't know, it's just the happiest dogs I've ever seen. And then, um, but the dogs are always, always trained with about five dogs at a time. Because so every trainer has about five dogs and they, everything they do is so smart. I swear the guide dog schools are so smart, but they do that so that whenever you get paired with your dog. So whenever the guide dog school, they, they, they give you a personality test. They know the personalities of the dogs. They know what kind of tra traveling you're going to be doing and all this. And so they match you with a dog that's just perfect for you. And then whenever they, they do that, that's the first time that dog's ever really lived one-on-one -on -one with someone. So mm -hmm. you just get this super, super crazy bond. And like, like my guide dog, my guide dog Eagle is more like a shadow. Like she is always there, constantly always there. I mean, if I go to the bathroom, she's waiting outside the door, you know, like, where you been? <laughs> What's going on? And it's just ridiculous. But, um, it, but, you know, but it's just awesome. And, um, but that means that a guide dog isn't for everybody though, because mm -hmm. I love dogs. I, I was raised around dogs. So having a dog around was, isn't an extra thing. But you do have to walk them, even if it's snowing outside, even if it's, you know, raining outside, um, even if it's Christmas, <laughs> you know, you've, the, the, their needs come first. I, f I feed, I feed, um, I feed my guide dog before I, I drink or eat anything in the morning. You know, it's the first thing that I do, you know, they're on a schedule. It's, you know, it's something that you have to get used to. And when you travel, you, it's like you've gained an extra 40 to 60 pounds, depending on your guide dog, <laughs> because, you know, you've always, you've always got that the right there. And, um, when you fly, your guide dog's always there, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, which is brilliant, actually. That's probably, yeah. um, and, and, you know, and flying is actually so much easier with a guide dog to tell, to tell you the course. truth. And, and the flight attendants seem to really love it. You know, I, I guess, I guess it gets boring flying the same route all the time. Mm -hmm. So you get like a cute little dog you can pet in the middle <laughs> or something. They're like, Oh, Hey, I, I love it when I fly and I see a guide dog. Oh my goodness. It's, you know, eat. Eagle is my second guide dog. My first guide dog, I still have. She's, she's retired. She's 14 years old and she, um, and she, she's always asleep. Actually, <laughs> she's definitely snoring, but, 
but um but, but she went on so many flights that she, she she's actually in the animal hall of fame for 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 service dogs because she just went on so many flights we, we visited so many children and i've had right. eagle for about three years and oh that's know, awesome tell us a little, little bit about the software um oh. that helps with you know, seeing certain things or mm -hmm. just visualizing them. And then also, can you um, talk a little bit about um, uh, why you wear sunglasses? Absolutely. Well, um, the, the software, which it's, I, I'm a huge nerd, uh, so it works well with me. But um, in my studio, I have a massive 3, 3D printer in the other, in the other office, the other room. Um, and it's just huge. But so, so I can print out statues. I can print out human heads if I want to be able to touch and see what it looks like. But, um, but now though, like with the software is, is well, we've had this since the seventies where you could print out a picture like on a brailer, but it's always been sort of like a Minecraft kind of picture where it's very blocky. But now though, um, with touchscreen devices, there's software that, that will, um, that you, you can actually touch it and it'll turn it into a tactile sort of feel. So, so, so you can actually, it'll vibrate and it'll make different sounds for, you know, if it's a, a thick line, it'll, it'll vibrate really slow and it'll, it'll make a lower tone. And so, so you're able to actually touch it and, and, and understand. So you're not seeing it, but you're able to understand the composition and, and it's just incredible and it's always getting so much better. And so I use that and, you know, so any of the technology, I'm, I'm always beta testing apps too. So I'm always doing, there's, there's cameras and different things where you can put it up and it'll describe it. It'll tell you colors, shapes, it'll start doing all this really cool stuff. Oh, the, the sunglasses. Yeah. Um, um, I, I usually wear sunglasses even at night. Um, I'm, I'm like the Corey Hart song from the eighties where yeah, I wear my sunglasses at night, but it's because my, um, um, I, I have light perception. My brain doesn't know what to do with the light. So it'll make my eyes dilate. Like it'll make my pupils di dilate and constrict and get big and, and do all kinds of stuff when there's light coming in. And it just makes my eyes turn really, really red and I get headaches. Um, so, um, so I usually wear sunglasses and in my studio, like I have all the lights on right now, but, um, but if I'm in here painting, I'll usually just have these little lights going, you know, so it's really dim. It's bright enough for the guide dogs to get in and out without, <laughs> without them bumping into something. But, but, um, you know, but it, it just, it's more, it's better. It just, it feels better with them on. And that's why like, you'll see some people with a visual impairment that wear sunglasses and some that don't. Some have um, have light perception that hurts their eyes. Some have light perception and it doesn't hurt their eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and some don't have light perception at all. So, you know, it's just a, it's a big mix. <laughs> right. Of course. Um, now, what advice would you give to um, others that are blind to have um, other types of um, uh, visual impairments? Um, it could be for, it could be for um, kids. It could be for adults, um, parents. I mean, even from a person that's blind to a professional. Uh, oh, oh my goodness. Um, be nice to yourself, you know, and let, and let yourself fail. Like let yourself fail. Like you need to be failing some. If you're not failing, then you're probably not trying enough new things and be okay when you try something new and it doesn't work out. You know, that's actually a wonderful thing. That's a really, that's a great thing. I, I've been fortunate in my painting career. Like I, I've been able to meet some people that I really admire. And every time I do, I always ask them, you know, so what's, so what's your secret? Like, what, what, what do you do that's special that makes that all this work? Like I, I've done, um, um, I did a portrait for Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Bridges. I've done portraits for Tony Hawk for um, lots of different athletes, lots of different musicians. And if there's somebody that I think like, oh, I just love what you do. And it, it's so crazy how many times it comes back and they say, oh, you got to fail. You just got to fail. Like, like you just got to get out. You got to put yourself out there and you got to keep doing it and doing it. And then it, when it doesn't work, you just try something different, but you, but you don't mm -hmm. let, you don't let it hold you back. And I, I just couldn't believe it that from all these people that I really admire that, that, you know, were at the top of their, you know, what, whatever it is they were doing had the same bit of advice. And I know that when I first started learning how to paint, I don't, I don't know where I got this idea, but I'm not usually that smart, but I had a really smart idea and it was that I wasn't going to judge anything that I did for a year. So I was going to learn, I was going to relearn how to draw, try to learn how to paint, but it didn't matter if it was working. didn't matter if it wasn't working. Just as long as I was trying, just as long as I was mm -hmm. giving it a try, I could fail all day long for 365 days. I could fail, 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 fail. And oh my goodness, what a habit it is to judge yourself and to be so hard on yourself. I think I would have quit 
the first day three or four times because, you know, because I, I make something wrong. I think there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. There's no way this is going to work. And then I have to remember like, oh, yeah, I'm not allowed to think that. It doesn't matter if it works or not. You mm-hmm. know, it's something to focus on other than this other stuff that I've been focusing on. And, right. Um, so just be good. I don't know. It's a long story short. Be good to yourself. Love, mm-hmm. love, love. I can't talk. Love yourself. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, that, that's, that's wonderful advice. Um, and that's kind of, I was, you know, that was kind of our last question um, or my last question to you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're a fantastic um, painter and um, oh, artist you. and you gave a lot of great um, insight. Um, and I'm just, I'm so, I'm so happy that you're um, a part of our community. 